everyone, welcome to part two of this series about health and fitness, strength and mobility, coaching and how it affects your skiing and boarding. When we're making turns and we're encouraging people to um, get better at their skiing, it's one of those things that we have to be aware of that as we increase and we push people to be the best skier, you're going to have to crash sometimes and burn. Let's face it, you wouldn't be a very good car um, driver um, a racetrack driver, a Formula One driver, if you don't crash now and again. You're always pushing yourself to that threshold to improve yourself. And we are gonna fall over at times and we're gonna overcook something when boarding and skiing. And depending on how your body is, will depend on how you're gonna take them knocks. Some people really suffer with the smallest of injuries, um, or smallest of knocks and falls. So what we want to be able to do with you as athletes when we're coaching you is to be able to push you a little bit more and more because we know that a low technique is at the heart of a quantifiable um, outcome. We also want to be able to take somebody from what they're doing comfortably and move them out of that comfort zone slowly. So when I watch somebody in strength and conditioning, let's just use that, doing a front squat, in the case of this athlete here, I see perfect position. I can see good T-spine mobility. I can see that he's got a good front rack position. I can see that the knees aren't caving in. We've got a strong foot. We've got great spinal uh, discipline. So therefore, in the simplicity of, let's say, strength and conditioning, I would look and go, oh, let's, let's put some more weight on this bar because this guy is maintaining good position. And if he manages to keep doing that, then we keep pushing the athlete to go to the next level. Um, and as we go up in weight, and we hit uh, about 130 kilo here, so we're heading towards two times body weight, eventually I push the athlete far enough that he can't maintain the position and he safely then bails out from under the weight. Now in skiing and boarding, it's, it's very much the same as we are progressing with, you know, especially racers and people like that. Racers need to know that they're going to crash out. They're going to fall out. And they, they try to obviously train themselves and mentally and physically to be able to deal with those crashes because they can be very, very obviously um, problematic if people get worried and nervous when they're skiing through the racetrack. So you will not maximize intensity or speed without making mistakes. But remember, these mistakes are what make you faster and the errors are an unavoidable consequence of development. We are always trying to push athletes a little further. So we know this is threshold training where we repeat a process and we basically see the scope of errors broaden to a point where to failure. And we drill techniques simultaneously to get people to go faster, but at the same time, we're almost training people to the point where technique starts to break down. And then we look at it and think, okay, why has the technique broke down? What do we need to do? Do we need to do something on the hill to assist this skier? Or do we need to take the skier off the hill and deal with something else? So we want to look at, let's say, a slalom race here I'm talking about. And I'm saying, look, if somebody sets a new record through the slalom course that we're watching one Saturday morning and his technique was really bad and he got through and he won, We'd have to say this means one of two things. Either with better technique, he would have even went faster, or more likely, we've then understood technique wrong. We, we've made a problem. We've created technique that we thought was super good, but this other guy, he has actually discovered a better way of skiing. It can happen in sport. And you know, you see the best in the world, like your Marcel Hirschers, who was, you know, at the top of the game for a long, long time, make an absolute superb precision movements, race after race after race. And, and he was very much in favor of not skiing to get better at skiing all the time. In fact, he often frowned upon and would comment regularly on the poor people who were up on the glaciers in the summer, that had the kids up there hammering away through the gates day in, day out, and say this is totally the wrong thing to do. He got in the position he did, not through just being on the piste and, and skiing day after day, but by doing other sporting activities and getting involved in other movements. He, he was very clever with his training, intelligent coaching and intelligent training. And equally, the guys who are, you know, throwing themselves off these huge jumps and doing a tremendous gymnastics in the air. 
These guys aren't just doing this um, when they go skiing. Do you not think that in the background they're doing strength and conditioning, mobility, they're doing um, trampolining, gymnastics, they're doing positional training? Of course they are, but what you see on social media is the end product often, and you don't see the, the sweat and toil in the background of how much effort they're putting in to get to that level. So what's really important to know is technique is everything, but you'll not express power in significant measure without good technique. You, you might expand a lot of energy doing it, but the, the thing that you have to understand is that the productive application of force requires good technique. If I take a simple example, and let's say we had 120 kilogram sacks of sand on the floor, and we have a, a big lorry that we've got to load the sacks into. Now, I'm only 70 kilograms, but let's say I'm with a guy who's 100 kilograms. You're gonna look and think, oh, this guy, this big bloke's gonna be able to get them sacks into there much more effectively than I am. However, if he doesn't know how to use hip drive, how to be able to hinge, or how to be able to kip and move his spine into certain positions, then he might actually just be using his arms to load up this truck. Whereas I might be using good technique from my experience in, in cleaning and snatching weights in Olympics, that I can use a popping action and be more effective after, let's say, he gets tired when his arms give out. So good technique's really important. We must also, though, respect when we're dealing with athletes, their physical and psychological tolerance threshold. It's really, really important that we don't push people beyond that. You've all done it. We've done it as instructors. You take your group into a slope, onto a slope that is a little bit too challenging for them. It's too steep or it's too bumpy. And then you realize partly down, you think, oh God, I've just set this group back a week because I've totally knocked their confidence. So respecting somebody's physical and psychological tolerances is important. And being able to inch them slowly out of their comfort zone is important without overstepping the mark and completely destroying them. So how do we identify good skiing or bad skiing? Well, it doesn't really matter. In any sport that I've dealt with, it comes down to a certain amount of elements, whether it be a, you know teaching a football player, a talented boxer, a skier, a, box, um, a, 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 a gymnast, it doesn't matter. We are gonna look at the mechanics of them, the technique, the form and the style. We want to tackle these areas. Now, the mechanics is a little bit confusing for people because it relies on you understanding a little bit about physics, a little bit about anatomy. It's all about angular velocity, angular momentum. It's about leverage, origin and insertion of muscles, relative angles, and this refers to the mechanics. So I am really concerned more about um, class one, two, three levers in the body. I'm concerned about which ligaments have an effect on the body in a certain way. What happens if I have coupled motion in a turn? This is mechanics. Most of you don't need to know too much about mechanics. However, in this series of videos, I'm wanting people to have a little bit of Anatomy 101 and try and assist them through this season to get enough understanding that they feel more confident in mechanics that I hope will help their micro uh, skills in coaching. Now when we look at the macro sense of what most instructors and coaches are looking at, they're looking at technique. And there's certainly nothing wrong with dealing with um, guests and skiers discussing technique because as I've said, it's the method to success. And it's the simplicity. Because if you have a coach explaining you things constantly from the mechanics side, then my question would be is, look, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it. You have to be to get across to a group or an individual something in a simple way and telling them that they have tibial internal rotation there and external rotation from this and, and discussing too much about the calcaneus and the navicular at the wrong time, when actually you just want them to tip their knees and ankles into the slope, is, it's, it's, it's over to kill. You have to understand that on the slopes, using mechanics might not be the right way, but understanding mechanics is the right way. And then, then 
translating that into technique for the guest is the correct method of, in, of, of inclusion. So, technique will include head and body position. You know, oh, you're far too far with your head inside. Or it would help if your rib cage is... You're just giving them technique direction, form. Now, with the form, it's more about, you know, if somebody comes down and you go, yeah, that just wasn't good. <laughs> you know, your form was off. You shouldn't have stood on your inside ski at that point of the turn. You should have angulated at this place here. Yeah, you shouldn't have angulated at that point of the turn. So this is to do with the form. And they're somewhat interchangeable form and technique. Style is, it's, it, the best way to describe style is when it's a really sunny day on the mountain and I'm staring into the sun and I can just see silhouettes coming down on the slope, I know from a distance which trainer that is of our very big training team at Ski Instructor Academy. I can see that's Gunther or that is Anthony or that is Jonathan or that is, I can see that because they have a little bit of a, a signature, a style. They have their own thumbprint on how they ski. And some of that's to do with their anatomy and you know the, the length of the leg or it may be to do with an injury that they have or something or how, how some people are a bit bow-legged and some people are very, you know, collapse in an A-frame slightly. Now, I'll get on to why people do that and what, if it makes any difference, but you can always see this little signature with people, how they do things just that little bit different. Normally, you see it in arm carriage, for example. So when watching skiers go down, I can watch Jamie go down the exact same run as I am going to go down on the same day with the same snow and we're both making a similar radius turn but we have our own sign signature to it and um, we have our own way of, of completing that turn and we shouldn't be critical unless it's a race you know if it's a race and Jamie's method is faster than my method then we would argue and say well Paul you should be skiing more like Jamie. <laughs> that could be an argument. But other than that, I think you have to be careful that you don't get wrapped up on trying to mimic and match somebody and clone somebody who you just couldn't match because your body type will not fit into that peg. So be always aware that we want people to ski. Like now you see the difference between Jamie and I. It's different but it's the same different, okay? We're both trying to achieve the same task. And hey, I'm 20 years older, so I'm going to look different as well. So who makes the better skier? Someone strong or someone who has great technique? Well, first thing that I have to point out is strength is extremely important in life. Um, if you want to slow down the journey to decrepitude and old age, then stay as strong as you can for as long as you can. And that's why it concerns me sometimes when people get into endurance sport too much. And don't get me wrong, running, there's an impact to it, so you do have a load. But of course, it, the upper body is getting left behind on, on your strength and conditioning. If you can remain strong, it's very helpful for when you fall, when you, know, when you do get an injury, you can recover that a little better, you can reduce the impact of the injury. And so strength is one of the things that I would tell people that they should be doing into their, their, their deathbed. You should be trying to get up and get them deadlifts done, get your, get your weights lifted. But is it really he who is strong, he who has great technique, that is better? Well, strength is the productive application of force. So I've already said that it, it's pretty much useless to have huge biceps or quadriceps if you don't know how to use them in a multifunctional way. And of course, the skill set of skiing means that it doesn't matter that I can lift twice my body weight in a squat. If I've never skied in my life, I'm not going to be as good as somebody who's done 10 weeks on skis at that stage. So being able to basically use your strength is more important at that stage then and you will require good technique because technique is an intimate part as well of safety and effectiveness and efficiency. And you need to be aware of that technique as well as the strength. So, 
when you look at like an apex of a turn, when you've got that critical edge angle and you're, you're at the apex and you're, you know, the amount of forces that are building up, you can see on my face is, you know, I'm aware that this is the point where I'm going to be momentarily under a lot of pressure and load and I need to know when to tighten and when to relax a bit to release the curve. So when I'm watching our, our team on the mountain all the time, they have a great ability to be able to be responsive to the terrain and the forces that they are playing with, as we've mentioned in previous videos with centrifugal force and how we handle centrifugal force. It's important that we know, and again, we know that our, so we rely on our good technique to, um, to hold us up when we're making these turns. And also because when we start to discuss the mechanics again and we look at people making short turns particularly so if, you know here is a very steep black run and um, a long turn with a 195 ski and um, as opposed to let's say a short turn which would be much more snappy much more agile dynamic to view and um, we're looking at different levers in the body and how we are going to use those levers Now, virtuosity is what I'm talking about here. People often ask me, you know, about um, plow turns, plow parallel, and they, they'll, they'll talk about this as to, well, what makes the difference in examination to when you're doing a ski instructor exam and you pass your level one doing a plow, and when you're doing it again in your level three or four, and I would say virtuosity is the thing. You make the common look uncommonly good you take something normal and you just make it extra special you know sprinkling the salt onto it um, and making a, a plow turn look good and look special it's, it's not easy it's just a plow turn but a plow turn from a level three level four ski instructor should look different to that of a plow turn from a, a, a guest or from a, a beginner ski instructor and the, the level three, four ski instructor is going to start to understand more about what he is doing, what he's feeling when he makes that turn. Because we have to understand that there's a lot of things we have to do as ski instructors. We have to work through not only an assessment of their movement patterns, but also their internal thought process. So in the next videos, I am going to be talking about their movement patterns. But first of all, I want you to be aware that when we're assessing people, we also need to understand how it is they think. Because what I want them to do is to buy in to my lesson program that I'm putting across when teaching a parallel turn, a carving turn, or whatever it might be. And some of these names here, you might look at and think, well, what, what, what is this? You know, what's the, the specialist? What's the novice? What's the leader? What's the self-sabotager? What's the skeptic? Well, these are athletic archetypes, and these are people, how people basically take on in board information. The reasonable, reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Now, in our courses, one of the things our students hear me say when I have the coordination and the welcome meeting, and I say, what our training staff wants is for you to be coachable. And that word's difficult because it's hard for some people, it's challenging for some people because if your archetype is the skeptic, if you're the person that questions everything, you're designed to question and doubt accepted opinions. And you notice there I say accepted opinions, like scientific proof, you know? You are just the skeptic, you know? And it's, it's not your fault, it's just how you've grown up and how you've developed. As a coach, I can't be critical of the skeptic and think, ah, this skeptic is somebody that I don't want to work with. You know, they, they're basically taking careful consideration. They're always thinking or they'll ask why. If you do something, why? And if they're not asking you why, <laughs> they're, they're going to think it in their head. Their weaknesses are obvious. It takes them a long time to develop because they're constantly doubting the information, even if it's completely proven that balance on the outside ski at this point of the turn, through the science and physics, it's the correct way to be, they'll doubt it because that's their job. That's their, their way of being. They constantly question your program and they'll affect other people. If it's not a private lesson, they will affect others in your group as well. So for us, 
it's really important as a coach that we don't isolate this person, but we make a connection and we're able to deal with these character types when coaching. It's that skill that is so important. Whether you be the underdog, whether you be the, um, the person who's the hypochondriac, etc. There are all sorts of, of these things that you have to take on board as a teacher. And one thing that you have to learn is it's not them. You know, how many times I have had to get rid of somebody in the coaching staff who's told me, ah, oh, yeah, those six are fantastic, but those two, they'll never ski ever. They're crap. And I just think, hang on, your job, you're being paid to look after those two here. You really need to make a connection with those two and establish what it is because our belief as coaches is that everybody, everybody can do to a certain standard skiing, snowboarding or whatever other sport it is they're doing. So be aware, you're going to get the self sabotage here. You're going to get somebody who, you know, requires very positive coaching. They require positive self-talking. They have an anxiety. It's just who they are. And yes, you can try to change them, but that ain't gonna happen in a ski lesson. That's something that they have to do over time and understand why they think that way. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this second part in the video series. The next part's gonna get very interesting because we're gonna be looking at your mobility assessment.